Hi, everybody. Welcome to this little webinar on maternal mortality in black and brown communities within the United States. We are putting this on through Fertility Within Reach. My name is Tyler Donovan. I'm in my last semester of grad school at Boston University School of Public Health. And for this Black History Month, I decided to address this issue. So first, we have a table of contents, Fertility Within Reach, Who Are We? an overview of maternal mortality, history of fear and mistrust, barriers to care, and creating systemic change. Uh, before we started, I did just want to mention quickly that obviously the literature is a little behind in language, so it is pretty gendered. Um, it's mostly mothers, um, women, women who are pregnant, stuff like that. Um, we know the data is up to date, but unfortunately the language is a little lacking, so that is something just to bear in mind as we go through this. So fertility within reach, who are we and why do we care? We are a nonprofit that aims to increase access to fertility treatment and fertility preservation. Uh, we do this through alleviating emotional, fiscal and financial stresses as individuals strive to build their community. How are we doing this? We educate our patients, we educate policymakers and service providers through evidence-based data, personalized consultations, workshops and legislative testimonies. Why do we care about this issue in our black and brown communities? Um, our goal here at Fertility Within Reach overall is to increase timely and appropriate reproductive care for bringing about safe pregnancies that result in whole, healthy babies. Reproductive justice is a human right and what we're seeing in our black and brown communities absolutely goes against um, how we perceive reproductive justice. An overview of maternal mortality rate in the health crisis in the United States. Since 1987, we have seen an increase in maternal mortality rate. You'll see that abbreviated quite often as MMR. Um, what does the HOW consider a maternal death? That would be the death of a woman while pregnant or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy, irrespective of the duration in the site of the pregnancy from any cause related to or aggravated by the pregnancy or its management, not from accidental or incidental causes. And I apologize right then, um, it's very gendered language, so that is just something to keep in the back of your mind. In, 18, in 1987, sorry, the MMR was 7.2 deaths per 100,000 live births, and it has steadily crept upwards. We see in 2020, which is the latest year with published data, Overall, for birthing people in the United States, it was 23.8 deaths per 100,000 live births. Here we have a chart that just kind of um, paints that same picture. We go from 1989 all the way to 2018. There's a few dips here and there, but overall that's a pretty staggering and upsetting increase that we see. Here is when we stratify the data, we kind of see a much more concerning truth so on the left-hand column, we have total MMR, and you can still see even within that three-year gap that it does have a steady increase. When you go to the middle column, that would be um, white birthing people, and you see it's a little lower than the MMR, or than the total MMR that we see on the left. And then if we skip all the way to the right, we will see the MMR for black birthing people, and it is just staggeringly so far above the average MMR, and especially for the white counterpart. Uh, you see here it's 19.1 compared to 55.3 in 2020. That's almost three times. This is just another graph just to illustrate a little better. If you like this graph compared to the one before, it's all the same numbers, all the same data. It's just put in front of you a little bit differently. A uh, quick little side note, you might notice how the Hispanic has um, significantly lower numbers, and this is uh, most likely due to the Hispanic paradox, which says that Hispanics generally have better health outcomes than um, their white and black counterparts, even though they have, um, even though they should have worse health outcomes based on their socioeconomic status, it is just sort of a paradox we see in the US, US healthcare system. Some believe this linked to Hispanics having closer family ties, closer communities, um, people care about their health more. That could be why we see that. I just wanted to point that out in case anyone was curious as, as to why their numbers 
were so much lower. We move on to history, history of fear and mistrust. So for generations, there's been history of fear and mistrust between black and brown communities dealing with the healthcare system. We can see this linked back to slavery as an institution, kind of how white supremacy has unfolded as the dominating culture and social framework, eugenics and forced sterilization. There's been mass dismissal from healthcare providers to their patients based on stereotypes that we kind of get into a little later. And then threats and harassment also kind of play into that. Um, so this is a quote from actress Tatiana Ali from um, the hearing before the House of Representatives on the topic of birthing while Black. Um, and this hearing was titled Examining America's Black Maternal Health Crisis. And this was in 2021. Um, and this was sort of a, a quote I picked up because it kind of lends itself to the qualitative aspect of um, th this health crisis. So it says, I've heard firsthand stories of people in paying being people in pain being dismissed, threatened, called drug seeking. I have heard of child protective services being called moments after babies are born because the parents seem unfit. The similarities amongst black families and the treatment and similar outcomes for indigenous families, queer families, disabled families, incarcerated birthing people are stunning and they all have similar roots. We're being mishandled, ignored, sterilized and completely disrespected. Many are now scared to start families because they know we are dying in hospitals. Um, as upsetting as this is, it does kind of paint the picture for the rest of this presentation, just how um, deeply disrespected the black and brown communities are and how it creates a barrier for them seeking out health services in the first place. We move on to barriers to accessing timely and appropriate care. So in my academic research, the barriers to care, the three delay model comes up all the time. Um, and it's kind of super important to understanding why this is such a big crisis to begin with. So the three delays are the decision to seek care, the delay in reaching care, and then the, the delay in receiving adequate care. So the first one, the delay in decision to seek care. This kind of stems from a lack of understanding about pregnancy. People aren't really knowing what they're supposed to know. They don't know if something's off. They don't know if it's just a headache or if it's something related to the baby. They don't know if they're supposed to be cramping in this way. So they just never seek out care in the first place. They have prior negative experience dealing with the healthcare system. This kind of is a, an underlying branch that we're gonna see throughout most of this. And then people have come to the sad understanding that there is a maternal death rate to begin with and that dying might just be something you have to accept if you want to become pregnant. Um, and I believe that's just a super, super harmful area that is just misunderstood and that people are actually falling into that is super upsetting. It just means that um, before they're pregnant, whether they meant to or not, they just don't have the proper resources and an un understanding of what it means um to have a healthy pregnancy and to carry a baby to term um so that understanding process is really a piece that we we have to fix going forward and financial constraints is another one that you will see kind of be pervasive throughout all three of these themes the delay in reaching care so this stems from not knowing which healthcare facility is best going to serve you and the needs of your baby um, and your family around you. The distance to the nearest healthcare facility can really be a big barrier. Um, there might be a health center five minutes down the road, but you know um, that that is not gonna be a good place for you to go, that they won't have the resources and support that you need, but it, it might be the only thing that you can do if it's the closest. So really having a good network of healthcare facilities out there is super, super important. Here we see the burden of transportation. Again, this is financial issues. There's hefty prices for ambulances, even if you do have good health care. Um, so people would rather just take their time, either do public transport or have someone drive you there instead of paying for an ambulance to get you there in time just because of the financial issues. We have a lack of readily available modes of transportation. This kind of goes back to the poor model of public transit in the United States, especially, and then in small rural areas, you know, it's gonna be a lot harder to get to main hospitals. 
If the birthing person is alone when a real emergency occurs, they're obviously going to have a major delay in reaching care. If something happens and they're unable to even walk, how are they supposed to get to the nearest health center? And then location, geography, and weather. This is kind of um, very rare circumstances. It'd be like if a big hurricane came out and knocked the power lines down, you can't call anyone, stuff like that. So we see that a little less, but it is still important to know. Third, we have the delay in receiving adequate care. This stems back to poor facilities nearby. And even if you do make it to a health center, they might have a lack of supplies to treat maternal health issues. They might have a lack of specialized staff that's trained. Um, they might have a poorly motivated staff. And then we have inadequate referral systems, which we'll see a little bit later. But this is just kind of having, if you get to a health center and then a bigger emergency arises, what is the next play? Like we need to have something lined up so that we aren't sitting around waiting and that's when stuff really gets bad. So we need to have better referral systems to get people to um, better staffed hospitals when those emergencies do arrive. And then again, money, we see this all the time. If you want the best care, it's gonna come at a price and some people just cannot, cannot afford that no matter what the cost is, whether it's their health, their baby's health, their family's health. Um, financial constraints are super, super important here. So here we have some kind of qualitative aspects to go on top of that. These came from um, a local licensed social worker who I talked to. She works closely with the black and brown community. She's a member of that community. Um, so here she told me that people's pain is not always taken seriously. There's harmful stereotypes that black people have a higher pain tolerance. And there's a lot of underlying reproductive issues that have a higher prevalence in black communities. So that in conjunction with um, their healthcare providers not taking them seriously can lead to extreme issues down the road that could have been stopped at the beginning. And a lot of the times people don't have good experiences with their healthcare providers. So what do you do if that happens? You move on to the next one. But what comes with that is you have to relive all your past medical trauma when you see a new provider. A lot of things in your charts don't carry over. So um, you're sort of just re-explaining all the bad things that have happened to you in I don't know why anyone want, would want to do that. So I can see why there is a big, um, why that is a big barrier to care because just doing that every day would not seem helpful. There's a lot of anger in these communities. So people don't even want to seek help in the first place. This kind of directly goes back to the one before it. Um, when you do have that, that history of fear and mistrust, you're just going to be angry, not going to want to seek help in the first place. We have a large lack of mental health support and then a large lack of doula access. So we see that when birthing people have access to doulas and they have access to mental health care, that their pregnancy overall is more successful. They have a better um, health care retention. They know more about their pregnancies. They feel more informed the entire time it's going on. Um, so just kind of plugging doula access and mental health support um, from start to finish through our pregnancy is a major, major advantage that we don't take advantage of, uh, take advantage of nearly enough. So how do we create systemic change? There needs to be representation in the medical field. Um, nobody, if you're black and all you see is white in the healthcare system, you're, you're not going to feel seen. You're not going to feel um, that you have their trust. So representation is super, super important. Here we see the referral system that I mentioned a little bit earlier. This kind of starts pre-pregnancy, throughout pregnancy, postpartum. Having an established system from the beginning makes the entire pregnancy a little easier and a little bit more uh, stress-free. And we know that the less stress, the better. So just kind of working with any healthcare provider to establish a system, even if you don't want to get pregnant, if you don't think that's in the cards for you, just kind of having a loose idea in case something does arise and you do become pregnant that um, there's a way to follow through from start to finish. There needs to be more holistic approaches when it comes to pregnancy. Um, physical activity can be used as medicine, meditation's great, mental health resources. Um, these are kind of the big three M's for the holistic approach. So we talk about it a little later, but it's not just all about um, the physical science behind it. There needs to be a little softer approach. Having specialized healthcare providers, um, 
if you go to one doctor, if you have a headache, you're not going to go to a foot doctor, right? So why, if you're dealing with infertility, are you going to go to a postpartum depression doctor? We need to have specialized healthcare providers that can deal with individual issues like loss, birth, infertility, postpartum depression, and postpartum anxiety. Having authentic healthcare providers leads to higher patient satisfaction, retention, and better health outcomes. There's already a, a weird power dynamic between healthcare providers and their patients. So just kind of leveling that playing field, finding someone that fits for you, it's really gonna help that satisfaction and retention. And this, the data is all there that when the satisfaction and re retention are there, that patients have better health outcomes. Systemic change is one thing um, that can bring about change in the maternal health crisis that we currently face in the US. Um, establishing a system of community health clinics that are staffed with public health nurses. Um, we see here um, that when these places are staffed with less doctors and more nurses, there's better positive outcomes. Again, it kind of goes back to that power dynamic. So when you see um, nurses rather than all these physicians walking around in white coats, it kind of sets you at ease a little bit more, lets you relax and be more honest with your healthcare providers. Arrange a plan once um, pregnancy is confirmed. This kind of goes back to the pre, during, and post pregnancy. Always having a plan is super, super important. And then again, holistic um, approaches. So we need to address both physical and emotional needs. So you can have blood pressure screenings, hemoglobin testing, fetal heart rate. We should also talk about the fears that these patients have surrounding childbirth, the expected social support they expect to have afterwards. Um, if they do have any unhealthy lifestyle habits, like excessive drinking and smoking, it'd be super important to talk about how to alter those because we know that that does not create healthy babies. Um, so again, the holistic approach is super, super important that I think is um, extremely lacking right now. So what do, you, what do we hope systemic change will bring about? Um, one of the main things is vaginal births. We see that the higher the CSET, the section rate goes, um, the more complicated these births get. Um, having doulas and midwives attending and guiding births rather than physicians. Again, this goes back to the less doctors, the better. Only have doctors on call in case a medical emergency arises. Doulas and midwives are trained just as well in that area. So they, they know what to do when a medical emergency arises and they can kind of guide you through that. Again, only have doctors on call if it's super, super necessary. There needs to kind of be an easy easy system, easy portal for people to use once they become pregnant. Um, you can kind of track the progress. You can upload questions, comments, concerns that kind of go directly to your healthcare provider. And then on the other end, these healthcare providers can share resources with you. Um, it just kind of creates an open, an open dialogue. It takes away that pressure, that weird power dynamic. You learn a lot between the both of you. There's always something to be learned in a situation like that. Lower the C-section rate, this goes back to the first one. Um, having a section rate below 10% is WHO recommended. Universal healthcare is something that I think a lot of us in this sphere of academia are really pushing towards. Universal healthcare is so, so important. It's just, it's the biggest burden in the world. And I think immediately if we had even a system close to it, um, our health outcomes in pretty much across the board would, would skyrocket. And then lastly, we have broadening public transport. This goes back to the barriers to care. The better the public transportation system is, the less people have to worry about money, have to worry about um, having some people on speed dial ready for them in case something arises. Uh, obviously it's not always great to have people who are about to give birth riding alone on public transportation, but it would, kind of knock down a few barriers to receiving the care that they need. Um, the first one on this page, I think is super cool. It's increasing assistance from the government to help low-income patients start at a level playing field. Obviously becoming pregnant and having a child is not, not cheap. Um, so any assistance that low-income patients can get would kind of be great. Um, I read a super cool article about a Finnish program called the Baby Box. Um, they basically, once the Finnish government learns that you are pregnant, they send a box to your house. It's a cardboard box. It comes with, um, toys, clothes. It used to come with breast milk or, um, 
formula, but they got rid of that because they want to increase breast milk. And then at the bottom of it, it actually comes with like a two inch pad. So the, the box that it comes with can actually double as a crib. Um, and I think a lot of people know that cribs are super expensive, toys are expensive, little books, baby books are expensive. So any, any help that the government can give is kind of super appreciated and does go a long way to kind of um, lower that health inequity that we see. We need better monitoring and more accurate identification of what counts as a maternal health. This sort of goes back to the first WHO definition. It's kind of super wordy. There's so many um, what ifs and kind of tangents that they can go on. So kind of tracking down what exactly is counted as a maternal death can give us more numbers, can give us um, better accurate demographics to see um, where programs need to be implemented, what kind of um, communities they need to be implemented in. So just better monitoring and more accurate identification would be super, super important. Improving all clinical care and public health initiatives to overcome social determinants of health is kind of piggybacks off the first bully, uh, the bullet point, just kind of um, even the playing field. We need strategic racial equity training sessions and implicit bias training for all medical professionals and institutions, no matter how long you've been in the field, it's always good to kind of have a refresher course on top of this, there needs to be a way for large institutions to be held accountable. Complaints of mistreatment, abuse, and neglect are lodged against them. We need to follow up so that um, a case of abuse doesn't lead to a case of death. So just kind of being on top of the way that these institutions are being held accountable when it comes to maternal health and um, neonatal health is super, super important. That is all I have for right now. Um, if there are any questions, comments, concerns, you can forward them right to my email address here. Um, I just want to thank everyone for listening and taking time to support this little webinar. Thank you, Fertility Within Reach and Davina. Um, so thank you. Look forward to any emails I get from you guys.